new innovation in floating shelf systems. The AWFS Fair returns to Las Vegas in 2021. Those stories and more coming up. Welcome to the Woodworking News brought to you by WB Fine Woodworking. I'm Don. First of all, I'd like to thank all of you for the comments that I received on the first two editions of the news. They're really encouraging and I appreciate that. What we need to do now is to increase the viewership. If you have friends that are woodworkers, please share this program with them and share it on social media as well, if you would. That would be greatly appreciated and will help the program. We need to get YouTube to start pushing it out to other woodworkers. I'd like to encourage all of you out there to subscribe to WB Fine Woodworking and ring that notification bell so that you know when new editions of the Woodworking News are coming out. In this edition of Woodworking News, I've added some new features. The first of those features is Woodworking Books. Now, I know a lot of you out there are going to say, woodworking books, I get all my woodworking on YouTube. Believe me, there's some wonderful books out there that have been around for many years, and some others are being published as we speak. So there are some things that we can say that are great about woodworking books, and there are things that you can also go back and refer to later. So this will be a program on upcoming books or books from the past that are outstanding books and will help you with your woodworking. According to Screen Rant, one of the first things people think about when discussing Harry Potter is the wand shown throughout the films. Wands are right up there with lightsabers when it comes to the most notable weapons in film. Fox Chapel Publishing is going to publish a new book called Compendium of Wooden Wand Making Techniques. They claim the book will help you master the enchanting art of carving, turning, and scrolling wands with 20 fantasy designs, step-by-step -step instruction, and wood guide. Get started mastering the art of creating your own wands to make beautiful gifts for anyone who possesses the love for fiction, fantasy, and magic with this book. According to Logan Whitmer, Editor-in-Chief at Popular Woodworking Magazine, the Compendium of Wooden Wand Making Techniques is a whimsical, fun quest into wand making. From carving to turning, you'll find a technique to suit your skill level. So maybe you can find a wizard that'll add magical powers to the wands that you make. Have fun. One thing that YouTube has done recently to really help woodworking is to encourage the use of hand tools. Here are some carving tools by Schaff. Schaff Wood Carving Tools has introduced a 12-piece foundation set. They call it a starter wood carving set for beginners. They claim while it's possible to start carving with this factory sharpened set immediately, the edges will cut better with a bit of finessing and polishing. The tools that are included in the set are shown here. The set of carving tools comes with their own canvas roll. Later in the program, I'll share a review done by one of the highly respected hand tool users on YouTube. In woodworking machine news, some of our woodworking tools really require sturdy stands. Here's some information from Jet. Jet Tools has introduced some benchtop machine stands. They claim they are heavy duty. These machine stands come in two versions. The universal benchtop machine table holds up to 400 pounds, and the flip top benchtop machine holds up to 300 pounds. While these benchtop machine stands are built for jet tools, they might work for other tools as well. In case you're wondering, swivel lock casters are available at an extra cost. I know you're out there and you say, Don, I don't need to buy something expensive from jet. I make my own stands. Well, that's good. I'm glad you do. But there are some woodworkers out there that would rather spend their time in their shop doing woodworking on furniture and other kinds of projects and don't want to make a lot of shop projects. 
So these kinds of stands are for people like that. Compared to back when I started woodworking, woodworking magazines have really disappeared from the market, but there still are a few left. And I'm going to be reporting on those. This is some information that I found out recently about Woodsmith Magazine and how they set it up. This is the cover of the latest issue of Woodsmith Magazine. It's volume 43, number 256 from August 2021. Recently, I got some insight on in how Woodsmith lays out their magazine. For projects, the magazine always has what they call an heirloom piece. It's a project that's technique driven. In this August issue, it's what they call their Monterey cabinet. Every issue also contains a designer notebook type project. The August issue has two, a wall lamp and a coffee table. These projects tend to be more contemporary. They're projects that their in-house designers want to make. At least one shop project is in every issue. This is partly meant to pay homage to the old Shop Notes magazine that Woodsmith had years ago. In this issue, the shop project is a moxen vice. The moxen vice was included due to the request from readers. They received many requests for this type of vice. One thing that Woodsmith seems to pride themselves on is the fact that they listen to their readers and they include projects that their readers want to see. Sometimes the editors will include what they call a weekend projects or surprise projects. Weekend projects, which are missing from this issue, are projects that are more attainable for woodworkers with limited shop time. Surprise projects, like the radio control boat in this issue, are ones that woodworkers wouldn't necessarily think of being in a woodworking magazine. Every issue of Woodsmith Magazine also includes departments. These are items or projects that aren't big enough for a full article. The main goals for Woodsmith Magazine are to present projects their readers will build and provide plans to assist the readers in building their projects. When there's not enough room in the magazine for all of the plans, the parts of the plans that didn't make the magazine are included on their website as online extras. This online extra shows the plans for the bandsaw dovetails for the Mox and Vice. As shown here, the Woodsmith plans are very good and well drawn. Phil Huber, the executive editor for Woodsmith Magazine, has made it clear many times that they love to hear from their readers. They like to put projects in the magazine that their readers want to see. So if you have any great ideas, share them with Phil. You might see a project that you're really interested in appear in Woodsmith Magazine. These home decorating reports are meant to help woodworkers who take commissions or you have friends and family that want you to make things. I'm trying to cover things that you might be expected to make sometime in the near future. According to Interior Design Info, floating shelves in kitchens have become very popular alternative to exclusively using upper and closed cabinets. They are often made of painted wood, stained wood, rustic or modern looking, or metal. One of the reasons floating shelves are so popular is because they are cheaper than cabinets. They also break up the monotony of several identical cabinets in a row. Many people prefer the mixture of upper cabinets and floating shelves because the items on the shelves can and add some color to a somewhat sterile looking kitchen. Some people use floating shelves above their lower cabinets and don't use upper cabinets at all. According to Better Homes and Gardens, floating shelves installed with concealed brackets update underused walls with streamlined storage and display space. Hang them in kitchens, bedrooms, living areas to stow necessities or exhibit favorite finds and artwork. According to HDTV, floating shelves are one of the magical unicorns of design. They seem to just work everywhere. They're often the perfect choice if you need a bit more storage or if you want to add some visual interest to a space. And since they come in all different styles and sizes, they're incredibly versatile. For quite a few years, they've been a choice in bedrooms and family rooms. And more recently, they're being used to replace upper cabinets in kitchens. And of course, with the live edge trend, 
we're seeing a lot of live edge floating shelves. In a recent Wood Talk podcast, Shannon Rogers mentioned that he was making some floating shelves for his sister's kitchen as a wedding present. Shannon said after checking out all the different systems for hanging these, he chose this system from Rockler because of the adjustability that it has. Since he won't be there to hang them, he wanted the adjustability so that his brother-in-law won't have any problems. In researching floating shelves, I found a company named Hover that claims to be the new standard in floating shelf hardware. In this Hover demonstration, they say that most shelves will hold about 22 pounds, but they claim that their shelves will hold 300 pounds load capacity on a 10 inch depth. At least that's what they claim shows in this demonstration. That system from Hover seems really interesting. I have no idea how much it costs though. It seems that lumber prices continue to fluctuate as you'll see in this report. I know a lot of you don't use dimensional lumber in your woodworking, but some of you do. And I know that there's a few of you out there that are planning to build new shops and you're sort of waiting for lumber prices to go down or at least stabilize so that you don't have to spend so much to build your shop. On this graph, we can see the lumber's future prices for the last year. It shows all the volatility we've had in the market this past year. This is that same data for the past six months. And this is the data for the last month. It still shows there's a lot of volatility in the market. Well, I don't know if lumber prices are going to stabilize or not. For now, it looks like we're still in for a roller coaster ride. I've heard from some that lumber prices in the stores have come down, though, but it's very mixed. OSB seems to be high. Somebody reported the other day that he paid one and a half times more for Baltic birch plywood at the store than he paid a year ago. So it's hard to say. This feature on Hardwood News is new to this edition of the Woodworking News. It's something I plan to continue in the future because I know a lot of you use hardwood. In this edition, I'm going to be talking mostly about the availability of hardwoods in the U.S. force. This report comes from the American Hardwood Information Center. Are we running out of American hardwoods? Hardly. Hardwood growth far exceeds removal. The USDA Forest Service reports that since 1953, the net volume of U.S. hardwoods increased by 131%. Unfortunately, these graphs that I found only go back to 2006 and 2007, but they do show the trend. Average annual growth exceeds removal by a ratio of 2.3 to 1. Most hardwoods are growing on the eastern half of the United States, but we do have some out west. In hardwood forests, trees reproduce naturally and prolifically. Young trees sprout from roots, stumps, and seeds, assuring the continued diversity of hardwood species and ages in the forest. Some species have been and will continue to be relatively more plentiful than others because that's how they occur in nature. According to the U.S. Forest Service, the biggest threat to our forests is climate change, not harvesting trees. Keep watching for future editions of Woodworking News where I'll expand more on the issues of hardwoods. One of the woodworkers that I follow a lot on YouTube is James Wright. For those of you that haven't watched James Wright, I highly recommend his channel. James used to work a lot with machines in his woodworking, but in recent years he switched over to using hand tools and using hand tools exclusively on his YouTube channel. So this is a report from James on those shaft chisels that I talked about earlier. James Wright of Wood by Wright bought a set of the shaft carving tools. He pointed out that the white canvas roll that comes with them was already dirty from just sitting around his shop. He wonders how long it will stay white. It's important to point out here that James bought these with his own money. 
James shared how the tools come in the role. He opened them up on camera. As part of his video, James did a pretty good review of these tools. I'd suggest watching it if you're interested in getting some carving tools, especially if you're a beginner. Well, as James pointed out, these chisels are only about $8 per chisel. Chaff does sell more expensive chisels too, but I don't know what the difference is between those and these. One of my favorite programs on YouTube is Highland Woodworker. It was really popular for a while, and then it disappeared, but they brought it back by popular demand. So here's a little bit of information about the Highland Woodworker. The Highland Woodworker is sponsored by Highland Woodworking and hosted by Charles Brock. One of the greatest features of this program is the moment with the masters where Charles goes out and meets with master woodworkers in their shops. In the latest episode, he's in the shop of Scott DeWard. The project Scott was working on in his shop was a door. Notice those large tenons. In this edition, Scott shared how he made a table saw sled that was slicker than any I've seen, and I've seen a lot of sleds made on YouTube. It's just like the sled that he used to make those large tenons for the doors. This is a sled that I'd love to try to make for my shop. It's quick and easy to make. The Highland Woodworker is available on YouTube and highlandwoodworking.com. So if you're looking for something to binge watch on YouTube, go back and check out all the old Highland Woodworker shows. There's several years worth, and the people that Charles Brock interviewed are really great woodworkers, and there's a lot of good tips in there as well. This is also another new section that I've added to the Woodworking News. It's a section on podcasts. I know a lot of you listen to podcasts. You either listen in your shop or on your commute going to work and back home every day. So here's some podcast news for you. Woodsmith Magazine sponsors a weekly podcast called Shop Notes. Most weeks, the podcast features Phil Huber, the editor of Woodsmith Magazine, Logan Whitmer, the new editor of Popular Woodworking, and John Doyle, who does a lot of the woodworking at Woodsmith. When the guys got stuck at home during the pandemic, they decided to have this podcast. It's available on the Woodsmith website, wherever podcasts are hosted, and a video version is on YouTube. They cover all kinds of woodworking topics, and sometimes they even have a guest. They've now had more than 80 podcasts. I watch the Shop Notes podcasts every week on YouTube. If you need a new coping sled for your router table, here's one you might want to check out. Woodpeckers recently introduced their iron grip coping sled. This is a new tool, not one of their one-time only tools. But if you want to get it on the pre-orders, it has to be done by August 16th, 2021. With delivery expected late February 2022. According to Woodpeckers, the features on this tool are this sled glides along the fence rather than the miter gauge track. Results in faster setup and better accuracy. Stock is held against the fence by the adjustable top plate and down to the base by the iron grip clamp. Two points of clamping contact with one screw makes the iron grip fast and secure. Sacrificial backerboard prevents backside tear out in expensive hardwoods. This new coping sled replaces the old one that woodpeckers used to sell. Well, it looks like conventions and fairs and things are starting to return to the United States, and the woodworking industry was one of the first back. The AWFS show was held in Las Vegas this year. It's held there every other year. The show was held July 20th through the 23rd at the Las Vegas Convention Center. AWFS stands for Association of Woodworking and Furnishing Suppliers. Every other year, this show introduces all kinds of tools for woodworking and making furniture. The fair covers all kinds of tools from large to very small. As usual at this show, there were a lot of large industrial kinds of machines, like this laser cutter. 
plus a large number of CNC machines. According to several reports, CNC machines were all over the place and they did all kinds of things. This one cuts with a saw blade and this one cuts three-dimensional objects out of wood. There were also a lot of robots at the show. Now here's a robot I'd like in my shop. It does the sanding for you. And of course some of the companies that make smaller machines like SawStop were there as well. And Festool was there with a very large display of their tools. There were many other makers of small woodworking tools on the floor as well, but their booths were much smaller. Companies like Klingspore were at the show, along with Tightbond. Of course, these smaller companies didn't get as much press as the big companies did. In the next few weeks, I'll be digging through all the results of the AWFS show and sharing any new information that I think might be helpful for those of us that have our small workshops. Watch for any of those news items in the upcoming weeks. According to the reports I've heard from those that attended AWFS this year, attendance was down. Vendors from Europe were especially missing because of all the COVID-19 requirements. They would have had quarantines at both ends, both coming and going, and that just added way too much to the expense. Hopefully this means that some of the smaller woodworking shows will start returning soon too. Those are great places to go and see the innovations in new machinery and other materials that come out for woodworkers without having to just order something over the internet. This is a Woodworking News News Flash. Pam and I are proud to report that our girl Lexi, champion Desiree Acres Live Wire at Wobegon, is now grand champion, champion Desiree Acres Live Wire at Wobegon. Lexi finished by going best of office at sex to best of breed, and best of breed owner handled. Again, I'd like to thank all of you that sent the encouraging comments on the first two editions of the Woodworking News. But now you can get involved in the Woodworking News. If you have a shop project or a piece of furniture that you made or something else that you've done, maybe it's a turning on the lathe, let me know. Send me a picture or maybe a short video clip. If you want to know how to get in contact with me, check out my website, wbfinewoodworking.com. I have an email address and I'll work it out somehow with you so that we can exchange the information, but I'll do it through the website. And thank you all very much for watching.